Walking for Nature. This series will run throughout July and into August and is a great way to learn about our amazing Farming for Nature ambassadors who work with nature every day on their farms to share ideas around this. Um, the format of the next hour is myself and Brendan will kickstart the event with asking our guest speaker, Mervyn Okmonti, a series of questions, and then we'll encourage you to use your raise the hand option, or you can write your questions into the chat box on your banner. Um, anything relating to Mervyn's farming practices and methods he uses for farming for nature. Before we start tonight's session, I would just ask my colleague Brendan Dumford to give a quick introduction to Farming for Nature, what we're about and what we hope to achieve through this series. Um, over to you, Brendan. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted that Mervyn is able to host us this evening. I had the good fortune to meet Mervyn and his, his wonderful family at the Burn Winters Festival last year when he was announced as our Farming for Nature ambassador. So he's a terrific guy with loads of information and hopefully all of you out there tonight will have plenty of questions to ask Mervyn. <laughs> Um, just a tiny bit about farming for nature. Um, it kind of what, what it's about. Well, it's really about what it says in the tin. Um, I suppose over the years, um, I work here in the Burn with farmers um, on a nature conservation project called the Burn Program. But over the years, I think a lot of us are very conscious of the fact that um, the story around farming for nature tends to be quite a negative one. Um, there tends to be a lot of criticism, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, about farming and its relationship with the environment. And of course, some of that is justified, you can't hide from that. But I'm always very conscious of the fact that there's farmers right across Ireland, like Mervyn and like our colleague Dorina from last week, who are actually doing great things for nature uh, in their own way, on their own farms, day in, day out. And to me, these farmers uh, should be acknowledged, uh, they should be celebrated, in fact, and their knowledge uh, should be shared. I think it's important that the lessons that Mervyn has learned on his farm are shared with other farmers who maybe are involved in tillage or dry stock farming and things like that. So I suppose we set up Farm for Nature and our approach was to kind of identify these farmers across Ireland. So we got nominators from right across the country to tell us about farmers in their area who are doing interesting things and good things for nature. Uh, we shortlisted those farmers and interviewed them and made short films about them. And we had a little competition to bring attention to their work. And we featured them a lot in media. You hear them a lot on the radio and on TV and in newspapers. And it's worked really, really well in terms of raising the profile of what farmers can do for nature, uh, the positive contribution they can make. But over the time, over the last couple of years since we've been doing this, we've also come to recognize the incredible knowledge that these farmers have. And this, this is what we're about tonight. Because a lot of people said, like, I'd love to farm for nature. I have a small piece of land. What do I do? And, you know, you can, where do I go to find this? And it's actually a good question. Where do you go to find that information? If you're a beef farmer or a dairy farmer, there's places you can go. But if you're maybe a, a farmer who wants to do a little bit for nature, who you ask? Well, we think farmers are the ones you ask. And that's been born out time and again. Now, this summer we planned a series of farm walks, but obviously they couldn't go ahead with COVID. So instead we've gone online and we've invited the farmers maybe to answer some of your questions um, online. It's never the same, but I think it's a pretty good effort and hopefully it's nice you'll find out just what we mean by the, the, the knowledge and the power of the farmers. So um, thanks for coming on tonight and um, I'm happy to be here. And back over to you then, Bridget. Thanks very much, um, so on to tonight's event, um, we're delighted to have Farming for Nature Ambassador, as Brendan mentioned, Mervyn join us. Mervyn manages a 500 acre mixed cattle and tillage farm with his father along the shores of Loch Ree in County Roscommon. He's one of our Farming for Nature Ambassadors from last year as his farm is actually a really good example of someone who's transitioning from intensive methods to working alongside uh, nature, but while um, not uh, effect while having an effective yield. So Mervyn, welcome, thank you for joining us tonight and we look forward to ha hearing how you do all of this. Mervyn, before I start, um, I'm actually going to share um, some pictures from your farm uh, while I'm asking you questions. Um, can you hear me Mervyn, yeah? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah, brilliant, excellent, hi, welcome. And um, so I'm just going to uh, share some of the pictures from your farm. So Mervyn, um, just to kickstart, um, you, you might just set the scene for us. Tell us a bit about the farm, roughly its size and the type of land and how you farm. Okay, well, <clears throat> it's, um, it's sort of sandy loam soil. So it's, um, that's, that's along the shore. That's only grazable land there and that's very, very sandy. Um, but we'll say 
we're probably half and half, half grain and half livestock. And um, there's some of the land that you won't put grain in. So the land that is um, livestock only is probably more traditional sort of natural grasses. Some of it is, is, is reseeded soil as well, but a lot of down, all down by the shore and all of that is natural and there's natural species growing there. So what grows best there just grows itself. And um, I think I said it in my video, I haven't looked at that for over a year, but um, there was a UCD student here a few years ago and she was looking at the different species of, of plants down at the shoreline and she had 99 different species identified. Um, and each one of them will provide different minerals and, and natural nutrients for animals. So you won't have to be trying to improvise with, with say minerals and getting the balance right the balance is there so if you can let the cattle into the likes of those then um you're you're better off that's the sort of an example of of the the soil that the tillage is growing in that was a, a wild oat that i pulled there um that's in a crop of beans you can see the exoderms on the on the roots which is a, a sign of healthy soil it's it's some people call them dreadlocks as well so um that's uh, an example of of the drought this year, you can see the bean is is starting to curl up, and um, the rain just came at the right time. That picture there is composting at the temperature gauge, and just keeping an eye on on farmyard manure being composted. It's fifty four point six degrees, and it goes up a little bit more. It's ready to turn. That there is a strip that I left in the beans that um, didn't get spray, and there's some of last year's cover crop coming in it. Um, that was a sort of an experiment. Um, I'll talk about that later. There is um, the nodules on the bottom of the beans that provide the bacteria or work, basically produce the nitrogen. That's part of a cover crop. That's my son, Ty, and he has a, a tillage radish in his hand. And you can see the root there under his hand. It's not a very good picture, but I just threw it in there anyway. That's a crop of barley and peas growing together, a combi crop. Um, that has got no sprays or fertilizer. It got it got a compound fertilizer in the beginning, and that's all. That's this year's beans. Um, the pods on it. So Mervyn, you might just explain to us, um, like a, a year's system for you in terms of like what you grow and um, what what you're kind of what you add to it or not add to it as such for throughout the year. Okay. Well. Um, we grow barley, oats, and beans, and um, there's common crop like peas and um, barley. And then we put in a cover crop, um, and then back out a cover crop then into the same crop, not the same crops again to be a rotation, but it'll be the same barley, oats, beans, or, or a combi crop. Combi crop is our first time this year doing a combi crop, so it's um, it's not it's 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 not it's just something that we're trying this year. So we, I can't really tell you how how it is yet because it's not even harvested, but it's it's looking okay. And from what you're doing, can you see um, benefits for for wildlife? Have you seen you you were saying about the different species on the lake, but in the kind of the short time that you've been doing more regenerative farming, have you seen uh, a huge increase in wildlife and uh, biodiversity on your land. Ah, yeah, you have. Yeah, there's um the biggest increase, I suppose, since we started, um, since we stopped plowing, should I say, um, is earthworms. There's a massive increase in earthworms. Like you dig up a spade full of soil and it's full of earthworms. Mm -hmm. So when you can, earthworms are some of the life that you can see with the naked eye in soil. There's most of the life in soil. You'll have to look under a microscope to see it. Mm -hmm. Um. But when you see earthworms, you know that there's others there too. Like it's just they don't they feed on like on the smaller things. And, so, um, yeah, there's like there is a there's an awful lot of wildlife. I can't say for sure that there's more or less, but there there is a there's an abundance of wildlife around. And not just on this farm, it's on, it's on other farms as well around like in the, in the area. But yeah, there's, there is, I can see an increase in, in a lot of birds and, and, and things as well. That wouldn't have been maybe as many 
10 years ago or that, but I can say, yes, since I started doing this, that there's X amount more or X amount less. Or I can't give you a figure, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Now tell me, you, you mentioned you do, you, you use cover crops. Um, mm. So, and you're kind of explaining slightly how you do this, but why is that, can you explain to people who don't really know or understand, but why would you, why do you use cover crops or, and not just let it sit? Okay, so there's a number of reasons. Um, when you harvest your crop and you're, say, in September, August, September, and you're not putting in a crop until spring, you're going to have bare ground sitting there all winter. So um, when you sow a crop and it grows up, first thing is it takes nutrients out of the soil to grow. So those nutrients that are in the soil are taken up into the plant. They can't leach. Secondly, you have a root structure there, so you're holding the soil and you're given a, a structure in the soil as well. Thirdly, you have an umbrella over your soil. So when you get the hammer and rain from the, um, the winter rains, like for months, you're, if, you, if you look at somewhere for a piece of concrete or something where there's a gutter and where water is dripping down the whole time, you look at the ground, there's a hole there. It has worn it away. Well, that happens with rain as well. It'll, it'll, it'll wear away and wash away your, your soil. So that's why you're doing it. So then you're also building your organic matter in the soil by putting in cover crops. Those cover crops will, will die off and rot and become um, organic matter. The organic matter in turn will help store carbon and it goes on like that. Okay, fair enough. And tell me, um, you use a strip till system uh, for to protect impacting the soil. Can you tell us a bit more about this for those of us who don't know what it's about and why you do it? Okay, well, it, it doesn't disturb the soil too much. It does disturb the soil a little bit, strip till. Um, but basically, you just disturb the soil where you want to put the seed. So you create a little seed bed um, for... Well, on our particular, the one we particularly use is um, it's a Clayton. So it tills five inches wide at about an inch and a half, two inches, depends on what you have it set, deep. And in front of that, there's a leading tine which goes down about four inches. So that disturbs about an inch wide, four inches deep. And on top of the ground, then five inches wide, um, about an inch and a half deep. And that's, that's all the soil you move. And you put a seed in there and roll it then afterwards. That's so your you're saving on diesel, you're not destroying your soil structure, and um, you're saving on time as well, obviously. But when you're not destroying your soil structure, you're also not reducing, you're not producing um, nitrogen and carbon dioxide into, this, into the air. Mm -hmm. So when you plow, you turn up, you, you, you release carbon and nitrogen. So you're losing, you need both of those to grow a crop. Mm -hmm. And when you lose them, you have to put them back. And the only way you put carbon back is through photosynthesis. And, and, and the plant respiring, we'll say. So, um, okay. And I know one of the other methods you use, uh, Mervyn, is low emission spreading of slurry. You might explain, like, why you do this as well, or, or how well, you Yeah, well, well the, the low emission is kind of in the, in the, in the kind of the answer. It's you're reducing you're reducing the nitrogen being lost into the air as you spread it. So you're, um, you're adding more nitrogen to your soil. So basically, if you require a certain amount of nitrogen to grow a crop, by not letting it off in the air, because it is volatile, um, and, and using a low emission trail and shoe or um, dribble bar, whatever system you use, you're going to um, reduce the need of having to buy fertilizer to replace what goes off in the air. Okay, perfect. Just one last question, then I'll, I'll hand you over to Brendan. But um, a lot of a lot of what you're doing is considered regenerative farming. Um, you might just explain that to people who don't know. I know you've explained different ways, but just how would you explain regenerative farming to people who don't know what it is? Um, regenerative farming, in my words, would be keeping something growing in the ground at all times and not disturbing the soil. That's pretty much. Uh, regenerative um, okay you're cutting back on inputs and stuff like that but that's the simple my simple answer 
Perfect, yeah. And um, Grant, I'll just hand over, but if anyone wants to send in any questions to Mervyn, uh, you can either write them in the chat box or you can, there's a mechanism to raise your hand and then we'll facilitate you asking a question directly to Mervyn. Over to you, Brendan. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and please do ask as many questions. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk too long. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to limit Brendan, myself to three. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah. Um, Brendan, sorry, I can't hear you there. I can't hear you there, Brendan. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. Just a couple of quick questions because I want to leave the floor open to others for questions. Um, the soil health is hugely important and very relevant now um, with the whole climate agenda because obviously with the, um, with the strip till or the, the, the low till method and the low emission slurry spreading, your carbon, your carbon footprint is probably much stronger than, than many other farmers. But have you noticed, um, Mervyn, that at times of drought and at times of extreme um, wet weather, such as we've had in the last six months, we had a very wet period of a winter and then a very dry period for three months. Do you notice that the soil functions a little bit better um, in terms of its adaptation to the climate change? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we're on very sandy soil here. So um, <clears throat> this year we could see um, a massive difference um whereas years ago when we would have got drought 2018 even even though we were using strip till um we suffered a lot worse so we did and this year it seems to have held up a lot better like even beans beans are they really demand water and it was just at the end that picture that was one of the worst pictures i could find i took a picture of it um that was on a headland under a tree so the tree was competing with it. It was sucking the water out as well. And it it did, for some strange reason, we thought that the beans would suffer, the, the grain was actually suffering worse. Um, but it, it did get off to a good start as well. So yeah, this year, definitely. And if you want to go out and travel on winter crops, um, you will get out earlier because of your soil structure. You haven't disturbed that soil. It hasn't gone into goo on yet or muck um, over the winter then. And the structure is there, the root system is there, everything is, is there to hold you up. And on, like you, the, you will be out way before somebody that's doing it conventionally. Okay, very interesting. I, I, I suspected as much, um, the soil helps is good for biodiversity, but also um, I think for the climate agenda, but also for, for functional farming, I think healthy soil makes a huge difference. Second question I had was, um, Mervyn, just talk a little bit about your, your livestock, the livestock side of the farm. Um, what do you keep? What kind of breeds? What, what, how, do you, how do you sell? Um, a little bit about that, just to balance off the, the farm system. Okay, well, we, we, we used to have sucklers. We're finishing up with them now this year. The last of them are, have calved. And we started about five years ago doing dairy to beef. So we buy dairy calves and we'll bring them to beef. Um, and then we have sheep. We lamb sheep, and we will we'll bring them to the factory, obviously, as well. Um, they also produce farmyard manure. Um, use your own straw, farmyard manure. Uh, the last two years, I've been trying to compost that, getting slightly better, learning a bit more. Um, it's not just as simple as you think. There's, it's, it's, there's, there's things to it that are just... Um, getting your temperatures right, trying to get your temperatures up sometimes when they just won't and what's missing, is there enough carbon, is there too much nitrogen in it or whatever. Uh, thankfully, I'm a member of Base Ireland and there's, there's other fellas that are doing the same thing and you can, you can hit them with it and they'll come back to you and between you, you'll kind of maybe come up with some sort of an answer to doing that. So yeah, you have that and that's, that's going back out on the land as well. So you're kind of, it's, the livestock and the grain kind of work together. So, you know, the whole circle, you'd be putting back your recycling the whole thing, you know, obviously not fully, you're selling off some of your grain um, as well. So in reality, it's not a full circle. You're going to have to bring back some that you don't. But as a bigger part, you are most, in the most part you are, you're, you're getting as much as you can back into the ground through uh, slurry and composted farmyard manure. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, the whole the whole um, uh, the whole thing about compost is is a science. <laughs> it's totally. very complicated. Yeah, yeah, um, it's not just a matter of leaving it there and letting it rot, like. No, not by half. We had a very interesting um, uh, presentation from Doreen Allen last week, who, who I think would be worth a visit. They've been they've been at it for twenty years now, developing the perfect system of compost making. It's fascinating. But you did mention base there, Mervyn, and I'd recommend anybody at the meeting tonight maybe to look into base because it's a phenomenal resource for those particularly interested in tillage farming. Just the third question I had, um, very briefly, was um, like Bridget said before, you're obviously changing system. You're 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 you've got a you're gradually shifting towards this low till system and now moving to from dairy to the dairy to beef system. Economically, Mervyn, how's it working out for you input output wise? Um, well, I started to begin. I suppose when we when we when we strip till the first year. We did it as a trial, um, so we had half a field, we got a demo of the machine and we had half a field conventionally done and we had half a field done strip till. Um, the strip till actually outdid the the other because the other actually got hit with leather jacket and the strip till yeah. didn't get hit as bad. And the only reason we can come up with is that the leather jackets couldn't move as freely in the ground so they couldn't get through as much and do as much damage. Um, the second year yields were way down and the third year they were down as well up a little bit from the year before and then they, they came back up and our yields have been fairly good up and down. It depends like every, if, if everyone else's yield is up well then the strip tail yield is going to be up as well if everyone else's yield is down the strip tail yield is going to be down it's 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 there's so many other factors as well that affect a yield um so uh i will say that it's not yield that you'll be looking at anymore you have to look at um kind of what you're putting in and what you're getting out like yes some you meet your neighbor or something say, how did that feel do? Of course, oh, that did three tons of the acre. Like, you'll tell him what it did. And he'll say, oh, mine did four, like. And yeah, then you feel like, oh, jippers, our system's not as good. But then if you look at what he spent on it and what you spent, then you say, no, we still mightn't be too bad, like. So, mm -hmm. and just yeah. before you go asking or anyone else goes asking, I have no figures here. To, so just say, no. if you're asking the questions on that. Good. I think that's <laughs> that we won't be co-broadcasting figures, but it is interesting, and I guess there's there's hidden benefits as well, uh, Mervyn, in terms of soil health. So that, that 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 all becomes relevant, and I guess you're a little bit more resilient to um, market factors if the price of fertilizer and stuff goes up, as it's likely to. Um, maybe then you're a little bit more resilient in some. Um, now maybe Bridget, over to you, because I think there's a bunch of questions coming in, and we want to make sure everybody gets heard. So. Over to you, Bridget. So if people um, continue to send in their questions, that's great. I'll just start um, kind of at the top, Mervyn, if that's all right. There's a question here from uh, Joe McDougall. Um, is there any added expense to the low emission slurry spreading and strip till, or is this offset by saving on chemical nitrogen and other fertilizers? Um, it will cost more to spread your slurry low emission. Um, it, it's... It's not all straightforward. You will have problems with little bits of stuff when you suck in uh, maybe a lump of timber or something that gets stuck in your macerator and maybe it gets half chopped up and goes down your pipe and maybe blocks it and then you have a pipe blocked and you have to get out and unblock it and it's dirty and whatever. It's not, it's, it's not just as simple as spreading it with a splash blade. And I think if you're getting a contractor in to do it, it's slightly more expensive. For that reason, you have wearing parts on the trailing shoe that's leaving a little channel in the ground and that, and they all wear. So, um, and of course, they have a bigger capital cost in that machinery. Mm -hmm. um, with the strip till, it's you have you, you're straight away you're reducing your plowing. You don't have to plow. Um, we haven't used a subsoiler now for a couple of years, and that was it was given. You went out and you subsoiled the headlands of the field. Um, but because the soil structure has improved, you're not doing as much damage when you're traveling on the field. So the subsoiler is kind of redundant. It's, it's sitting in the shed, which will probably be sold in time, but we're, you, you don't just jump into things. Um, so so it is, there's, a, there's a bit of offset anyway against it. There is, there is, yeah, yeah, there is a little, there is a little. Um, you will, it's slow. You're not going to see suddenly that you're saving a heap of money. You, it'll be over time that these things happen 
and mm-hmm. you're not, if you do everything the one time, well, you won't know what has made the difference. Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah, you're going to get a difference. But if you keep everything the same and change one thing, and then you say, well, that hasn't made a difference, and then you change something else next year, and you see a big difference. And sometimes what you change this year mightn't make a difference, and the next year it might, or vice versa. Like, so it's it's mm-hmm. it's hard to kind of hard to kind of just say or to answer these kind of questions. There's a lot of variables, yeah. I have another question here there for you, Marvin, um, from Michael Costello. Marvin, can you explain combi cropping also for uh, a livestock point of view? Can you detail some of the changes that have taken place? Um, okay, so combi cropping is, is growing, say, two crops together. So you have, like, I'll just speak about our own, and it's um, it's barley and peas. And basically, for the for what we did was we, we put out compound the same we bought three bags of I think it was 12723 and that's all the fertilizer that got uh, in hindsight I probably should have put on some sort of a pre-emerge spray but I didn't mm-hmm. it hasn't affected the crop but I'm afraid that maybe next year it might um, there might be a bigger weed burden we'll see um, but it got no fungicide it got no other spray since and I got no extra nitrogen now the peas will the peas will produce nitrogen. They'll put nitrogen. They'll fix nitrogen back into the into the soil. Mm-hmm. And because it's not as dense a crop, say, of barley or peas, then your your disease burden won't be as big either. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the rest of that question? Yeah, no, I, th- I think you've kind of yeah. Can you explain combi cropping for a livestock point of view? And can you give some detail? To some oh, of the yeah. Well, from a from a livestock stock point of view it's um your peas um your peas are high in protein so you'll be bringing up so if you combine that crop um you'll probably i know from some of the other base fellas that had it done they probably i think um they had about 18 percent protein mm-hmm. coming back out and um which is like it's very good like for for a finishing for a finishing feed you don't need 18 percent like probably 12 14 percent to be plenty protein mm-hmm. um but say for young stock you know grown grown stock um then 18 percent would be right up there or even lambs or something like that like so it's it's pretty much all you'd need as okay. far as protein would go so there's another question from a daniel devine um i'm farming organically but um but wondering about the impact of importing slurry from a conventional farm going forward in terms of the impact on microbial life like dung beetles etc i'm not qualified to answer that i don't know that is absolutely fine in fact he asks another question for you as well how long did the transition to a regenerative system take you i'm still at it um <laughs> we're still changing things and trying things um i suppose for the main part probably about three years before we kind of came back up again after kind of going down so mm. the third year we kind of were happy again okay perfect and then here's a question from a tom tyranny uh Mervyn, are you going to stay with strip till or progress to no till or oh, progress to no till yeah yeah um and then there's a, f- uh, a final question here from the, from the crowd. And if anyone else has any que- uh, questions, do send them in. Um, this is from uh, Lena and Seamus O'Regan. Uh, thanks, Mervyn. Really interesting. Um, why the change over to dairy calves from Suckler? Okay. Um, we got mycoplasma into the Suckler herd and we reduced the numbers. And the other thing was the figures weren't adding up. It was just wasn't making any money for us so we just said right we'll, we'll we'll try a few dairy calves and see how we got on and we got on fairly well with them we were happy enough and we got a few more the next year and then we bought a, a feeder an automatic feeder and we got a lot more and then last year we had even more and then we started to have problems so what we have learned from that is when you go too much intensive and you push it too much you're going to unbalance things and that's when you have problems. It's nature's way of trying to balance itself. Um, would have been probably the same with sucklers. Keep your, you know, we're just, you just get too intensive, too many calves maybe in the one shed and stuff like that. Um, and, and you will, we find anyway, you, you just, it's, the more you have, the harder it is to look after them too, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So 
Um, but that's that's why we changed, and we have cut back significantly this year, and it seems to be working again. So hopefully, it's always an adaptation, isn't it? I'll just yeah. ask a question myself, and then I might hand you back to Brendan there. But um, so you know, obviously you're farming alongside nature, and what do you see as the biggest opportunities and success points for you in doing this, Mervyn? If you were to kind of pick something. Um. Well, I suppose going forward, it's, it's, it is going to be, rec it is being recognised, like people are aware of the climate, people are worried about the climate. I think some people like making a fuss about the climate and they probably don't really know what they're talking about, but um, whether or not they do, it doesn't make any difference. I think people are going to be more aware when they're buying food, um, what kind of a footprint it has. Mm -hmm. um, like people, the problem is I think people want cheap food and people have got cheap food because of CAP and whatever, it worked well that way and people have got cheap food and there's a world market and I think, I think rather than maybe trying to get everybody to say use less fertilizer and stuff like that, I think for tillage farmers and that there needs to be some sort of an incentive to kind of grow more protein crops and stop bringing it in from Argentina. We need to look at the bigger picture. So we'll say you go to Brazil and all South America where they're cutting down rainforests, killing orangutans, whatever. And then the footprint that's in this soya that's coming in that we're using as protein. Instead, if we could grow it ourselves in this country, you're growing a crop that's nitrogen fixing. Um, you're self-sufficient as far as protein goes, or you're, you know, you're, it's there. Mm -hmm. And you're you're bringing in a rotation, you're you know, and you by by um, fixing nitrogen straight away, you're going to have to use less the next year on the following crop. Um, so I think uh, even doing that is kind of a, an achievement, even in itself. Um, I suppose sure uh, an achievement being nominated and, and becoming an ambassador for farming for nature. I can't leave that out. Like that's. Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. Perfect. No, no, that answers that well. Um, I'll just I'll take one more from the crowd there. I had said I'd hand over to Brendan, but there's some, there's, they're flying in now. There's one here from a David Kelly. Uh, Mervyn, you mentioned base organisation as a great support source. Is there any other education or helpful resources or organisations that help transitions that you've done? Did you read books, attend other farms to see for yourself, or how did you build up your knowledge so that you made the changes you are at now? Other than base, um, trial and error was probably one. Yes, I would have looked at videos on YouTube. I have read some books. Um, I wouldn't be a massive book reader, but I would have read bits and pieces of articles as well. And like base is you you do go out on farm walks that is that is like you'll go out to a farm you'll have a meeting in a shed you will go out and walk and look and kind of get what that person is doing they'll say what they've done someone else will give their opinion on what they've done and what happened and what worked and what didn't work and you'll go home with a head full of knowledge and you'll forget half it and then you'll remember some of it then when some situation turns up yeah. and you know so um I would still put base up there as my number one. Uh, and, and you mentioned there, I think Brendan might have mentioned that it, it's for tillage. It's not just for tillage. There's dairy farmers in it. There's sheep farmers, beef farmers, there's organic farmers. There's, there's, it's, uh, um, I couldn't put it out there enough for anyone who is interested in it. You mightn't be let in, but <laughs> 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 you could try anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Over to you, Brendan. Yeah, and the, the web address for BASE, I think Bridget has posted it in there, BASEIreland.ie. So it's, it's a great resource in response to that question. And I think it's what I love about what you've just been saying, Mervyn, it's, it's just great to see a farmer like yourself kind of taking ownership of this, you know, this climate agenda and this biodiversity agenda. I mean, because there's plenty of people talking about it, but there's, you know, not really enough people doing something about it. So I think that's what's great about the Farming for Nature Network and, and, and yourself included. Now, while I was listening to you, I had, I had two questions in my head that I really wanted to ask, but then while I was waiting, um, Althea Grief and John McDougall pretty much posed the same two questions. And they're kind of 
there, there are two questions which are quite interesting, um, Meryn. The one is about, um, like, where did it start for you? What made you, um, you know, decide to go down this route to kind of explore different ways of doing things, the, 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 um, the methods that you use, the strip pill methods and so on? What, what initially um, persuaded you to make the change? And secondly, it's a kind of a, a joint question is, where would you cite, like to see yourself ending up with this? What would you, what would you like to see happening in about five years? Do you have a five-year plan? I really don't know what started me. I think in the beginning we went, before we were stripped till, we were min till. And we kind of saw like this, you know, we're doing, we're doing a little bit better than plowing here. And here's a system here that'll do a lot better. And as you kind of, as you kind of went from one system to the other, you learned more and more and you could see results and you wanted to see why you were seeing results. And then you could see, you learned more again and you wanted to do more. Then you could see that like some, like Tom Tierney asked, was I going to stay with strip till or go direct drill and um, total non-disturbance? And yes, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will be um, total non-disturbance. It's just another step. And like, yes, it costs money to keep changing as well. And that's why you don't just go from one thing to the other. You have to kind of prove it and dip your toe in the water and see if that's going to work. But by looking at other people who have done maybe the same thing before you, you can see, well, that has worked for them. What have we in common with them? And, 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 and you know, that kind of thing. Sorry, I've lost, I've forgotten the other part of your question. Um, yeah, uh, uh, but just, just stick with that first part. What the initial, the very first step you took that was maybe different from your neighbors. What, what prompted that very first step, Marvin? I can see how you, when you're on a journey, you keep making change, but the very first step you took, what, what prompted? Yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. That's a good while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 if I, I can make up something for you, but I really don't know what prompted it, to be honest. Fair enough, fair enough. You're just um, a creative soul. Yeah, uh, I think it might, have, it might have been just like kind of trying to, take off the workload at in the springtime to be honest um in the very beginning um but okay. you, i know the, i know the, i know the rest of the question now you where did i see myself in five years time exactly in five years time i'd like to be able to see a regenerative label on food and the same as organic and i'd like to be able to um see a market for that mm. and supply that market along with others Something like grass-fed beef, here's regenerative beef, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be like, you know, it doesn't have to be um, anything special majorly, but something that's recognized even, you know. Yeah. Do you think, Marvin, that there's a danger of confusion for the consumer between terms like organic and regenerative and, you know, is, is it difficult then to explain the two, because the consumer likes a very simple message. Uh, so. Well, I think I think regenerative is 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 really doing a lot of what organic farmers already do, but with the backup of like you're not totally tied to, you know, whatever. I know organic farmers aren't totally tied either, you mm -hmm. know, for welfare reasons and whatever they can they can get a vet to treat their cattle and then they have their longer withdrawals and all all of that like. But um. Yeah, understood. Um, I think, Bridget, I might ask one more question, but then I think Owen Murphy raised a hand. You might let him in. Um, I'll just ask one more question, um, 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 Mervyn, from Fergal Costello. Is your method, you find, more labour intensive? Sorry, I didn't catch all that. Excuse me. Is your method more labour intensive compared to, you know, the alternative? No, less. No. Less. It, it would be less. I'd say, I'd say less, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Bridget, hand over to you again. You're muted there, Bridget. Okay, sorry. Um, Owen, you have a question there for um, directly from Mervyn. Do you want to ask it there? Yeah, and, and thanks. Uh, thanks for hosting the meeting. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, Mervyn, it's great to great to listen to you. Um, I'm a, a fellow Southwest Common man, so I, pa I pass your uh, your property a lot. Um, uh, launching down in Karen Yore to, to access the lake and um, yes. as somebody I'm working in, in uh, conservation you know and you're ticking a lot of the boxes you know I, I grew up uh, with local farmers my neighbours my friends working on local farms and uh, you know to hear a farmer talk the way you're talking um, especially with things like uh, 
you know, stopping splash plates on, for spreading the slurry. These sort of things that are relatively simple. They cost money, but they, they, have, a, they, know, they have a huge difference. They have a huge impact compared to, um, especially on the shores of Loch Ree, spreading the slurry with a splash plate. And a few, few hours later, after a bit of rain, you can see the slurry in the water, you know. Um, yep. the, the, the mint till and, and, and progressing to no till, I mean, all these things are fantastic. Is there anything that you consider um, one of my um, other things with uh, that that I would I think are is a major factor um, for nature and whatever else would be intensively producing silage and mown silage early um, and obviously to get early crops it's a monoculture of a certain type of grass and you're spreading a lot of bag manure on it to get early silage. Um, is there anything in your head or do you know of anything? Thing that um, you know, will your combi crops and protein and peas and that is it as a replacement for silage um, going forward, or do, you know, will most farms still have to produce silage, or if the government incentivized people to make hay, would um, instead of silage, would would, would farmers uptake and, and things like that? Do you know? I think uh, lads will keep cutting silage because of the climate we have in Ireland. For a start, I think. Putting your bets on hay is is um, probably dodgy enough. Yeah, it's understood. Yeah, um, yeah. As far as as like you have your perennial ryegrass, your monoculture. I, I I totally see where you're coming from in that, and that's one of the problems I have with with trying to produce grass-fed beef as well. But if you look up um, smartswart.ie. Um, it's a thing that they're doing up in UCD at the moment and they're in lines of state, they're trialing it. And it's where they have um, a mixed multi-species of, of grasses and like things like um, plantain and chicory. And basically, if you look at the, uh, you, you nearly need to see the graph, but if you look at, at the graph, the response from nitrogen is very, very small on the mixed wort. And if you look at the, the, say the perennial grass, it starts in the bottom corner of the of the grass, and the more nitrogen you put on it, she'll shoot up. And somewhere in the middle, she'll cross across this mixed wart, and like it, that's where they're the same. It doesn't it doesn't um, yield. We'll say if you get let's just pick a number of ten tons to the acre of um, perennial grass, um, you might be only getting, say, six um, of this mixed swart. But you have only put on maybe a third or less of the nitrogen to get that. So again, looking at, we'll say, like looking at yields and that, you mightn't have a massive crop, but it hasn't maybe cost you and you haven't had to put on the nitrogen. So I'd say, like, um, Going forward, Europe are going to cut what fertilizer goes out um, for every farmer. So I think the likes of Smart Swart and that are going to probably become more, but they will take more management. If you want to keep seven species alive, um, like overgrazing is going to be a problem, um, or even cutting too low, you know. Um, there's other things like red clover as well that you can put in instead of instead of those grasses and, and make it part of your rotation. Um, I think basically there is other alternatives, definitely. And I know there's other people that are looking at them, or even around here, dairy farmers and things have been talking to me about them, um, young lads. And like they are looking at, they're not maybe into, you think dairy farmers are all bad, they're not. Um, but you know, um, there, there, there is some of them looking at other options and seeing what could they do like to change. And there is, I like, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm under pressure here. I'm not. This isn't my thing at all. Um, so even to to try and think of answers here. If I was talking to you one on one now on the side of the lake, I'd probably tell you a lot more. Um, but um, that's great, Marvin. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I. I yeah, I think that's fair enough, Marvin. That you know, you can't be answered. You know, you like you say, uh, it, there's a lot to to know about farming. Now, there's a, the, moving on to the next question. There's one here from Joan McDougall. We import a lot of feed, and it's kind of moving on the, the similar train. We import a lot of feed. If more people grew 
protein crops, do you think farmers would buy Irish feed over cheaper imported feed, Mervyn? Some would and some wouldn't. Um, no more than people going into supermarkets, some will buy the cheap stuff and it's price that they're looking at and then there's others that will, you know, look at the label and say, well, this is produced in Ireland, I'm buying this. Yeah. I don't know. I'd like to think that the imports of some of these grains will be looked at more stringently going forward. Okay. Um, Mervyn, I'll just ask one question there and, and then I'll swap you over to Brendan there. Is, um, what, um, what do you feel is the biggest threat to nature on your farm um, in, or, or, or other farms in the near, in the near area? Chippers. Oh, biggest threat to nature. Well, it's a good sign if you don't think there's many. I don't know. I think maybe nature itself in some cases. I see, I'm see. i seeing an awful lot of grey crows and magpies around, and they're quite a threat to nature in the springtime when there's birds nesting and that. Um, something like that, I, I know, and Owen is probably um, doing a good job on keeping mink numbers and stuff like that down. Um, they are a threat as well to ducklings and, 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 and lots the, anything they can get their paws on. Um, so that, I would think if they're not controlled in some sort of a measure, um, I, I, I know lads weren't out this year with COVID and that, but I know gun clubs and that did keep down numbers of great crows and magpies. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, definitely a lot more of them around, so I'm hoping that they don't have a, a, a negative impact on other birds and that this year. Just, uh, just one last one thing there. Um, as you're talking about different species, what can you give us any kind of unusual species that are on your farm that perhaps wouldn't be on your neighbours' farms or, or unusual habitats that you have, or, or do you think it's kind of? I think most things that are on our farm stray out into the neighbours anyway. <laughs> Fair um, I, I can't, I can't really know. Um. I would have I would have said we had a lot of lapwings, um, but to be honest, they have they have re really reduced over the last few years. They used to nest in between the right wide rows, and you'd see a lot of chicks in that out. But uh, in the last few years, lapwings have really have really declined. I saw uh, one curlew last year when they were out doing the video for the Farming for Nature. And I heard a curlew this year, but I haven't seen him. Mm -hmm. There's also a, there's also a, a white-tailed eagle out around the lake. You get a glimpse of him every while again, every now and again. So you do. So he's quite a bird. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. I'll have you have Brendan there. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Just a, a couple of other things that I've been thinking of. Looking at your video, um, Mervyn, um, it's fantastic. But the one thing that kind of stands out by the lake, especially, are the hedgerows. You have sort of a lot of mature trees, mature hedgerows. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you manage the hedgerows and, and, and why you manage them in that way? Okay, well, we manage them so that they don't encroach into the fields. Um, it depends on the hedgerow how we manage them. Uh, like. Some hedgerows you try and uh, just you, you you maybe just breast the sides of them. Others you will top them. So anywhere that there's a road, I top them all. And I can actually see where you don't where you don't cut the tops. So you'd say you'll get a you kind of get a dominant um, variety. So you'll get say maybe elder and blacker or white thorn. Um, that'll that'll grow and be dominant but if you have something like sycamore it'll kind of smother out everything and you'll just have sycamore and there'll be nothing underneath it the light will be blocked out of it whereas if you have something like a sycamore hedge or ash and you cut the top of it you will get more diversity um you get like honeysuckle and that coming up through it and you, you'll get different things um so if you have just a white thorn hedge you don't have to cut it every year um if you have something like ash or sycamore it could grow six or eight foot every year and you just keep cutting it back and you will you will get more diversity coming in when the light gets down um you'll have other you'll have other things coming up which are good for pollinators and and, and such um i think like some people say oh don't cut your hair your hedge every year 
Um, I think it really depends on what's in the hedge, whether you, you go out every year or whether you don't. But I think that every everywhere you can, say, leave a black tar and leave a white tar and let it mature into a full tree because you have the whole area of that tree. It, it could be the same as 50 metres of hedgerow as far as flowering goes. Like so, And um, where you have a nice dense hedge to your magpies and that won't get down into it to rob the rob the eggs, you know. So a hedge that's a hedge that's cut every year doesn't necessarily in my idea now, I'm no expert, but just in my observation, I think it's not always a bad thing. It is like mm-hmm. in some cases, but it depends on the actual hedge itself. So if you have some that you cut every year, some that you cut every second or third year, and some that you you know, don't cut at all. Like there's hazels in that and they don't need to be cut and, and you know, they all do their own thing. They all, but it, like, if you just like zoom in on one and say white horns, I want to leave them. Like they only flower for a few weeks every year. Then what happens when they go? What does the pollinator, pollinator go for? He has to go for something else. So you need something to feed your pollinators from, I suppose, February till November, really. You'll have, still have bees out in November on a, on a, on a mild day like. So you'll have ivy and stuff like that, that yeah. they will be, that will be flowered. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, because I mean, I suppose every hedgerow is different. And I think if you can, if you can plan a management regime that gives you a good diversity of habitats um, without skinning it too hard, I think that, that, that can be a very positive outcome. <coughs> the other question I had, Marvin, <coughs> excuse me, was uh, going back to the economics again, right? So. If you look at your farm, you're producing, um, you know, you're producing food, whether it be beef or or or, or, or uh, barley uh, and other things. But you're probably your yields might be a little bit back um, compared to some of, of, of more intensive systems. Um, but at the same time, you're probably delivering a lot of these ecosystem services, be they carbon sequestration or biodiversity or so on. Um, how do you feel about agri-environmental schemes? Do they have a place, do you think, in your farm? And if so, what kind of agri-environmental support do you think would work for you? Um, because you're delivering these good environmental outcomes, um, but do you feel you're not being rewarded? And do you feel you should be? And if so, how? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think hedgerows should be looked at. They're important. You're, you're, you're taking in carbon from them for while they're in leaf and photosynthesizing and, and respiring um, you're also providing shelter and flowers and stuff for pollinators but uh, i think for cover crops it's another thing you're 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 they're growing they're putting carbon into the ground as well um and i suppose when you're when you're not plowing and releasing carbon you probably should be recognized for that too so they would be the things uh we are like we are in gloss, so you are being recognised a certain amount for low emission slurry spreading, we'll say, and 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 the likes. But um, I don't agree with everything that's in gloss, really. And one of the things that looks good maybe on paper is the bird cover crops. And as a contractor as well, I have done some jobs for people where they have gone in and they have a, a bit of a field that's no good for anything and there's old scrub and stuff on it and you think, ah, I'll clean this up now and I'll get so much money for doing this. And they do, and they sow a dual crop in it and basically the birds come, the crows come and eat half it before it has even grown and then it's home to maybe rats and stuff, which have their place as well, but maybe not just the amount that does be in, in the crop. And they've destroyed a perfectly good habitat that was there to create this habitat for certain species. And I think the likes of those schemes really need to be looked at. Um, there is a new reps coming. I haven't seen anything really on that or what it's going to be yet. So hopefully that might be a little bit more focused on the environment in real life. Yeah, the details are fairly vague on it. It's actually interesting you mentioned about the the cover the, the um, pollinator strips. I, I, I know some tillage farmers in in, in the UK where uh, they've been rewarded for not just the presence of these pollinator strips, but the quality of them as well. So it's a kind of result based approach. So they manage yeah. them uh, quite well to deliver the maximum outcome, which is quite interesting. One more question here, Mervyn. Have you been able to reduce your chemical fertilizer and herbicide usage? Have you seen a marked improvement in soil structure? This is from Glenn Boyd. Yeah, we have. Um... 
and going forward I'd hope to be able to even reduce it more um by well I'd hope to be able to like even so on so on um more combi crops if it works i I can't say that we will make it work because this is the first year we've done that so um but like that has that has no chemical pesticides put on it at all it had no nitrogen put on it so it just had um it just had a compound fertilizer behind the beginning which has massively reduced it now not all the crops are like that um but i would hope by getting good cover crops and um maybe even crimping some of them cover crops that we would massively be able to um reduce going forward um even the chemicals but um we're not there yet but we're we're going there in small steps i know that there is um there's a fella in England, Tim Parton, and he's he's he has he has sowed a lot of um a lot of crops and all he has used is just a a, a, a herbicide before he sowed and that was it. Um he, he managed and he's using compost teas and stuff like that and there's there's a good few fellas in base um using compost teas now instead of fungicides and that. And like when you think the composting is, is complicated, this even gets more complicated. But um, I suppose it's not until you really try it yourself that you're going to learn. But looking in at what they're doing, it does seem quite tricky. But they seem to be making a fair a fair good uh, go of it. Amazing, it is, yeah, so, Marvin, so I just had one last one before a quick one before I hand back to Bridget. I mean, <clears throat> if you look at all the policy, this um, farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy, and you know a, a lot of what's going on, the, the, the wind seems to be behind what you're doing. Uh, it seems you seem to be certainly moving in the right direction, in, even in anticipation of some of the strategies. In terms of you know, we have 140,000 farmers um, across Ireland. And obviously, they have a huge role to play in, in the whole climate and biodiversity crisis. How do you think we can, you know, persuade some of those farmers to, to, to maybe make that shift? And a lot of them have made it already. Maybe others are a bit reluctant. How do you think we go about, because we haven't done it very well so far, about convincing farmers that there's a future in this more, um, I guess, climate smart, biodiversity friendly type farming that you practice? Um, well, first of all, I will say that most farmers. I'd say all farmers are doing something for nature, um, no matter how much how much that they're doing against it, we'll say. So I think pointing that out to them first is probably a good plan. So let them see, look, like, what you're doing there is good, and you deserve to be rewarded for that. Now you can do that as well, and you'll, you know, and you'll see this, this, and this, and if you do whatever, rather than saying, right, we're going to stop you doing that and you can't do that and you can't do that you're just it just gets the farmers back up and even if someone co came in to me now in the morning and said you can't do that anymore like everything else that i've done they didn't see they just saw what i was doing wrong and they tried to reprimand me for it so rather if somebody came in and says i really like what you're doing there i like what you're doing there is there any way you could kind of do a little bit better on that um I think that's the approach rather than coming in and saying, right, that's that, that, and that has to be changed. That's just my, my opinion. I think spot on, Mervyn, that's, that's human nature. You don't, you like to, you, you know, you have to, you have to acknowledge uh, and get people on the side before you can make them change. Listen, thanks so much from my side. I found it fascinating. Uh, and there's so much to learn from you, Mervyn. So I'm greatly appreciated and I hope everybody else did as well. So just back over to Bridget then maybe to close off. Yeah, thanks very much, Marvin. As Brendan says, it's all very inspiring and it's great to see the changes that you've made, you know, and it's step by step. And as you've pointed out, you know, it's you're you're on the journey and hopefully it will encourage others. Marvin, just one quick, quick question. Um, if you were to give farmers like just one last top tip for any all farmers across Ireland of one small change they can make on their farm, what would that be? Um Every farm is different and every farmer is different. So I couldn't tell any farmer what change to make. But I would, um, what I would say is look at what's there already and take heed to what you have. Like every farm has some sort of nature. Most farmers, most people, like if you go back to the, if you go back to the lockdown, 
people suddenly thought that because of the COVID-19 that there was more wildlife about. There wasn't. They just started noticing it because they weren't running around like mad busy and stressed out. And, you know, like the amount of people that I see walking on the road, out for a walk, trying to enjoy the countryside with headphones in their ears, listening to music, and they don't even hear you behind them. How can you enjoy the countryside when you can't hear the nature and the buzzing of the bees and the birds around you? Like, you don't need headphones. Go back to your house and listen to music there. Like, it's just, it's, it's, you, you, you. so I would say the same to farmers. Like, just, just have a look at what's there. Know what's there. When you're picking stones, instead of, uh, instead of being out there picking stones, it's an awful job. Have a look under the stone when you're picking and see what's there. You'll see a worm and you'll see a centipede or a nearwig and a few beetles and things. And it's just, it makes, it makes farming so much interesting, like compared to having to go out and pick stones and do the whole field. Like it might take a bit longer, but you'll enjoy it much more. Mm -hmm. no, that's, a, that's a great, great tip. Kind of see what you have there and, and if you can enhance it, then do. Yeah, brilliant what happens in species. Listen, Marvin, thanks a million for your superb uh, contribution in sharing everything. And uh, it's great to have, you know, such great spokespersons like yourself speaking out for nature and kind of incorporating it into farming practices. And if any of our audience would like to see a short five minute film on Mervyn's farm, then please find it on our website, uh, farmingfornature.ie, under our resources section. And um, and then if any of you know someone that would like to see tonight's session, we'll have that up on our website tomorrow um, as well. On the You can find it on the homepage and you, it will be a recording of the hour and anyone can watch it uh, at their leisure. So next week, we're delighted to have a sheep farmer, Susanna Crampton from County Kilkenny uh, joining us. And if you're interested um, in, in uh, joining us for that session next Monday at 8 p.m., then please register. But until then, thanks again, Mervyn. Lots of lovely messages coming in there, thanking you for your time and your honesty with the way that you're farming. And, and thanks to my co-host, Brendan. And hopefully we'll see as many of you next week. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Mervyn. Bye-bye.